myself. And um, but it's not the work that is described in my blog and in the book Paradise Hills is coming out is my own, and um, and it's uh, for what it's worth, it's not the cast. So um, this poem is coup de grace, coup de grace. Uh, she arranged her hair carefully using bobby pins and an industrial strength blow dryer. Gazing at the mirror and primming, she was dressed in a see-through pink nightgown, her legs clearly visible. They were solid and firm as sheets of paper. And I looked into the room and said, baby, it's time to go. One minute, sugar, she said. She turned her head to the side and regarded herself as if she were a Monet or a Rembrandt painting, beautiful and exquisite, but she was not either of these things. Rouge colored her scarred cheeks, pockmarked from disease and drug use. Soon she removed the bobby pins and blew out her cheeks. I'm ready, she said. How do I look? Like a million dollars, I said, and meant it. Later, as she stepped out onto the stage, facing those hungry eyes, and as she commenced to dance, I thought we were too old for this game, like two exhausted gazelle cut off from the herd. But we made a living. We survived, even if it was hand to mouth. I managed her, and she performed. That was all I guess I could say about us. On stage, she performed the coup de grace, her graceless hips gyrating in the glaring light. Then I saw her stumble on the fall, and I lurched forward to pick her up. She threw her arms over me and sobbed into my shoulder. What's wrong, baby, I asked, but she didn't answer. By that time, I knew we had to get backstage, and I half carried her there, the jeers of the merciless crowd ringing in my ears. Backstage, I asked her what was the matter. She said it was just an accident, and that didn't matter. But I knew, we both knew, that it was over. The hyenas had gotten to us finally. As I looked at her, I saw my future in her tear-stained cheeks, the rouge cake like dirt, and I said, baby, we're not through yet. And she nodded while biting her lip. The next night she was performing, and it was as if nothing had happened. She did the coup de grace and stepped off stage, smiling like a little girl. And I was proud of her, of us. We had made it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, modern Cowboy. Um, this one's called Modern Cowboy. Um, old man Larry listened to the radio while he was working, working hard in a 5x5 five five cubicle. His hair was grizzled, his eyes the color of a calm sea after a storm. And while filing papers, he sometimes whistled and stomped his feet, a cowboy locked in a tall building. And he sang sometimes, and his co-workers would peer over their cubicles at him, wondering if he was mad, but old, la old man Larry wasn't mad. He just knew a few things. Tapping along with his feet to the music, old man Larry was happy. <laughs> All right, you guys in the mood for something dark, something light? I got two minutes, so, you know, quickly. Boy, right. how, however you feel. Okay. That's my choice, yeah, as dark as possible. Yeah. yeah. Dark as possible? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's good. I got you. Then go to Cheers me up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what did you call your The ghetto. I walk through the tired streets of the ghetto, and I hear my neighbors, some of them sitting on their porches, smoking joints and talking about nothing in particular. I see a pretty woman through the window of her kitchen. Her face is gray and her eyes hollow, and I wonder why. My footsteps take me far. Soon I mount the steps to my home and enter a cauldron of a room. The heat has been left on. My girlfriend is sitting naked on the floor in a meditative pose. How is work, she asks, her voice murky in the paralyzing heat. I go to the kitchen and open the window and pour a drink. My heart is as weary as these streets. And I sip at my drink and stare at the hanging limbs of the oak tree in the yard. And I know that something is wrong, but I don't know what to say to her. And I think that this is what life in the ghetto is like. A hot room in a house with a picket fence, surra picket fence surrounding it, just like the others. I lay my glass down and rub my temples. I'm not ready for her yet, but I will be in a minute. Just give me a minute.
This is old there you go. poetry by Pablo Neruda. And it was at that age poetry arrived in search of me. I don't know, I don't know where it came from, from winter or a river. I don't know how or when. No, they were not voices, they were not words, nor silence. But from a street I was summoned, from the branches of night, abruptly from the other, among violent fires returning alone, and it touched me. I did not know what to say. My mouth had no way with names. My eyes were blind. And something started in my soul, fever or forgotten wind. And I made my own way, deciphering that fire. And I wrote that first faint line. An eye, infinitesimal being, drunk with the great starry void, likeness, image of mystery, felt myself a pure part of the abyss. I wheeled with the stars. My heart broke loose on the wind. Thank you. Thank you. So Jane, thank you for the problem with Aruda. And I put your name on the list. I'm sorry for my, my egregious errors. Clarity. All right, so <coughs> and we have uh, Ty coming up. And then we have uh, Buford. And then, um, Owen and Dudermann and Jane and Adolf and Stephanie and Richard, Aloysius Val Pazel, Bob Hohenheim. Oh, Jane, you're already on there? Yeah, okay, good. Sorry, I'm just like, I need to mind on there. And this man, a welcoming round of applause, please. Door. People at the infancy of their adulthood partying till 2 a.m., closing the nightclub. No apparent job to worry about, like I do with my fourth special education teacher supervisor on the way. The teacher's <coughs> aide in his 65th year battling the near all night party next door for sleep. <laughs> This is called you. You are slim, beautiful, moving in your shy and sensual way, searching in natural, somehow polished looking light for a regular life, something in your past burning except for the reveling of your professor daughter, your own riding an amazing stream, a sad, beautiful river that flows, ready for a hard, angry flood, barreling forth. I took two classes from at San Francisco State 
back in 68. He was a native of Ireland, County Roskimen, a poet and a barrister. He held classes in a small cottage on Waller Street in the Hague. He liked my work and we became friends. He was honest in his criticism of, of my poetry. Ah, no, Wally, that was, they're on an ego trip, he would say of some rivals. Stan Rice, the late Stan Rice was one of his rivals. I was a pale goblet stem of a boy. A pale goblet stem of a boy, indeed. Decadent rubbish, Wally. He was honest with me, considering, considering my poetry. That was bad, Wally, he said of one of my poems that tried to be mystical in an Elliot-esque way, but ended up being vague and semi-nonsensical. <laughs> 2014. Rocks endeavor fertile soil. Last year was the year of toil, the, the year to abandon royal heritage. The, the Trieste spoil standards Wild witches withhold the flowers that defies brides, birds, and boughs. Epitaphs fall forwards cautiously. At the Trieste, the final hour before six, people dart in and out, frantic running about. There is no more to a once and future metaphor. Once there is music, mark the time. Wasted on etern waiting, waste, waiting on eternity. The eternal sky, the plaintive gulls, high above us. Oh. At Starbucks, the cold, swift, stiff sky stares down at me. Girls pass by. It is a cold day in January. Deck, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue sees me through. Overture. Night falls on the quiet tree, trees. The, the um, pensive, passive sky remains the same. The night roars its, its, its neon love. Airy sounds from above. My mind is on a trip. Metaphors give society to slip. Night star. Oh, see the star. It glows nymphet like in the heavens. It glows and pulses. It was there last night. It was as the night air and will stay till tomorrow. It will vanish when day comes and replaces it with blue skies. Her blue eyes, sullen in darkness. The skies are sullen, are gray and sick, and gray and full of rainwater. December, Christmas carols. People march on by the sidewalk. Suspend the march on by the the sidewalk suspends and soars on the clouds of forgiveness. The cement-like sky forgives and forgets its gloomy slow roll of heaven. And thank you very much. Johnson and Johnson, John Paul Jones, John Paul Sartre, Pope John Paul, John Paul, Ringo and George, George Clooney, Mickey Rooney, Rosemary Clooney, Rosie and Mary, Baby, Baby Jane, Blaine Jane, Mickey Splane, and Palacio, the talking wonder gerbil, <laughs> and began the poet, poetic reading the 1973 Blanche White Pages, the Polish edition. <laughs> Can't make it. I just don't understand. So, with all that aside, will Zane please come forth, or fifth, as he wants to be a different idea. <laughs> <laughs> right up the list, all
all those people who just crossed the bus. Oh, yeah, I haven't been here in a while. I see some familiar faces. Yeah, and it's yeah. Yeah. where yeah. And the train goes by again, the freeway purrs, birds chirp, this is home. This is nothing, this is the everlasting something that's been living in the cavern of your soul, getting worn by the fire, moving fingers through the flame, watching smoke rise. This is nothing but the everything that surrounds you, laughing, fucking, living, breathing, mother nature mistaken for fatherly figure, turning your skin bronze and waiting for the sun to pass down the horizon, bringing morning to the other side of the world, laying in beds, the streets on rooftops, singing harmonies with the universe, duets with the instruments of the city, howling through metal pipes, whispering through the gates, rattling the street signs. This is nothing but a remembrance, a, a reconstruction, a memory turned concrete, an attempt to be understood, to see the chaos, the unorganized nature of a human being at one point in time, the entropy of the living soul. This is the empty, this is the open, this is the free. We are the cat calls, scratches against chalkboards. We are everything that is wrong with the world and at the same time, the salvation of the wicked hands and knees on the ground, wishing for an eternity when the energy ceases to exist, when Theories disappear and there is only what is. This is nothing but a dream, but a story, but a life, but a being, but a canvas covered beautiful skin, scraped ugly, a scapegoat painted bright orange for easy recognition. We are the cross and we are the nails and we are the blood. This is everything. This is nothing for now, but we'll find more. And now we see a little more crashing up against the bluffs of the cliff. This is where life ended. This is where life begins for instance of pale realization. Stained glass sun shining through the chapel open ceiling and birds flying through. This is the ever crashing, everlasting ocean in a few words spit out into the open. This is nothing but some muffled truth directed toward an old youth with hands wrinkled and mind worn. This is for the ugly, this is for the not good enough, for the wishing to sleep through the rest of the week. This is for the weak, this is for the humanity, for the humanity, this is what you make of it. This is for existence, for the singularity, the parents, the rapists, the teachers, the tear-stained sheets, late night car conversations pulled over on Santa Fe for sacrifice, for sleep, for love, for waking up terrible and falling out of bed beautiful, this is for the next day. Now isn't that something? <laughs> All right, uh, the next set of readers, next people coming up, we have Adolf, Stephanie, Richard, Jane, myself, uh, Alexis, Martin, and I want to make an acknowledge to your arrival of the teacher of the evening, Miss Jane Sarah, uh, Sarah? Sarah Page. Thank you. Give her a nice round. Thank you. 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 Can I have your name? 
Aboriginal people not glad how bad the tenderloin. Therefore, about faith, get up in truce. The steps entwine the ball of yarn at the tenderloin. And after saying all this, I still love the tenderloin, and you shall too. <laughs> Trilling, far away, sometimes not far. I can't remember what I saw. A ball of white, yeah, that's her. Up here through the trail of despairing, openly not caring how far to go. Who saw me? Was it troubling? I hid, I thought my facial parts. Otherwise, we all look alike, trilling, coming down the up the hearing, calling for a friend. Out of witches, tumbling, sinking, looking rough, I find, I hide, I pause. Trilling up and down, high street to the park, like fish in a net, I was caught. What now, my friend? No more money? Is it the end? Or will you eat to begin again? Going up the down feeling, trilling. Oh. Terror slash bleep. Yeah, you can, yeah, you can sit at the table with a plate setting, a napkin only. No fork, a knife, a spoon, no plate, a bowl, a saucer. You can, you can sit at the table. In the past, it's the day. We are alive now, it says, and when we see forward, we see better, more clearly. We leave you this. What you want, what you want, to be compassionate with my heart, to see clearly within my mind, and to act in faith, to be happy and in peace, totally, actually, really, absolutely. Daddy bought her a bicycle, and she rode that bicycle all over town because of you. Because of you, she just rode it up yonder. What? There she go. Because of you, she rode a bicycle, and you know what? Her mommy and daddy bought it. We have to go to San Jose, and it's a long way from here. Because of you, a mommy and daddy bought a bicycle. You should see. They said, go on, girl, ride that bicycle. Ride, girl, ride. And she went, zoom that way and that way. And you know what? And we looked and we said, wow, that girl can ride a bicycle. Go, girl. And we looked, the bicycle did not have any wheels. We wonder how she rode it. Other people got on it. Ball up. I got on it. Skin my leg. My poor leg. And she got on it and she just rode that bicycle. Because of you, she rode a bicycle that did not have any wheels. Because of her mommy and daddy, we have to go to San Jose. There's a long way. Where are we yonder? This is when they got to the highway. They sent the chicken out. It was chicken. Got caught in the middle of the road. And then the wolves stood on the other side. They said, come over here, little chicken. We take good care of you. The, 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 the colony said, come over here, little chicken, we take care of you. The chicken said, I'll just stay along the King's Highway. But they didn't go out and come out of my wife. The woman said, I had some, had some white water I was drinking. I said, drink water. Because of you, mommy and daddy just bought her a bicycle. I was born in Dutta. I was born in the London Tower, 1530. I was born in prison. 
They came to my daddy and they said, would you join the British Army? We'll treat you good. And when he joined, he decided to come and visit us and they flogged him anyway. They tied him in irons, sent him off to the Americas. When he got there, they worked him five years. He was supposed to do seven, they sold him on the fifth. Daniel Boone's wife, Becky, she's already had four kids. She was sold five times. She had to do the seven over again. But that's not the scary thing. So we got to the Americas. We found out I see my neighbor. And the first thing I did to my neighbor is we rode back home. You know what y'all should do instead of fighting? Y'all should take your sheep. <laughs> they said in Montana, the, the, the men are men and the sheeps are nervous. My sheeps are always glad to see me because I always give them a little two sheep. <laughs> and then they back there. And you know when you take a sheep, it's so like that. Man, don't you know you should clean that shit up? My sheep been so happy when she told the other sheep. You ever heard of, um, there's a sheep called the Judas goat. The Judas goat. They wonder, man, how can you stay here so long? You, I turn sideways, you can't see me. Look forward. I turn forward, you can see me, but I turn straight on, you can't see me. He said, I lead all the other sheep to the gate, to the pearly gate. St. Peter is a big old white man who walks around. And when I was a kid, they said, the only thing that you people can do is go around the back and be kept out of prison. But they didn't realize. White folks, hell is boring. The white folks, hell, they be down there gambling, man, the streets are crazy, yeah, they doing everything. So God, I went to visit my daddy in heaven. Yeah, and I used to go up. And I went over to the tank. I said, what are those, Daddy? He said, those are my hell drawers. He said, this is my other son. And one day, he was in hell. He said, I was in hell. And I stroked the oven. And somebody says, hey, Daddy. They said, what? He said, God, he had his hell drawers on. But because of you again, she wrote a bite. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm bringing up Stephanie Manning, a very special person here, well known, one of our regular people in our town. And welcome to all poets and people posing as poets. And I'm going to read one little poem. Did you all see the moon last night? Full moon. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I was lucky to be out in David's, way out there. Uh, and, uh, and I was working way out at Lake Branch, and there was no light pollution at all. And I got sick of this job, so I tiptoed out, but if you know, I look up and there's the moon and Jupiter. So here's a poem by Lee Paul, who is one of the, also called Lee Spy, uh, that I was turned on to by uh, my neighbor, who is Chinese. And this goes like this. I have not turned my steps toward the East Mountain for so long. I wonder how many times the roses have bloomed there. The white clouds gather and scatter again like friends. Who has a house there now to view the setting of the bright moon? <laughs> and then one other thing I'm going to read is uh, the obituary of our uh, former host, uh, Gianna Whitwood, who's in that big frame there. Well, her birthday, well, her, her 74th birthday was last week on uh, January the 28th. Uh, and she died in 19, 2010. So she didn't make it to 70. But anyway, here's her, her obituary is really interesting. I'll, hear, I'll donate it to Dan for the permanent files of the Stanford Browns. Born Stephanie Virginia Jenna Hillard. January 28th, 1941, passed just after midnight, Monday, November the 15th. She is survived by her loving children, Mary Shea, Thomas Wedgwood, and Susanna Wedgwood, daughter-in-law of Bennett named Zola, and her grandchildren, Eli, Colby, and Evan. She was a treasured member of the San Francisco community and lived in the New Ashbury neighborhood for 39 years. She was a poet editor and the sacred grounds and uh, of the sacred grounds anthologies number one to fifteen, master of ceremonies at the sacred grounds poetry readings weekly for 
19 years. A book of her poetry, uh, next day, I'm sorry, Next Century's Child, Meridian Press Works, was published just days before her passing, and she left us in the most joyous time of her life, surrounded by loving friends. She studied comparative literature at the University of Indiana, Bloomington. She was a Druid in the order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids. She was Grove Mother of the Monarch Bear Grove and of the Mananan Mar Lear Grove in San Francisco. Minister of Shamanistic Poetry ordained by the Organization for the Integration of the Whole Person. She will be profoundly missed, and her daughter's email address is on here. Give her thoughts again. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Richard, then Jane, then me, then Lewis, then Martin, then our before our feature fair page. So Richard, come on up. Give us a roll. What passes for that? <laughs> Well, unfortunately, I started to sing as American. I wrote this a few years, uh, well, I started this about three years ago. Uh, but I've gotten in the habit of saying blue stuff, because so you say the American Empire, you got to say which one. So uh, I say we are the Usan Empire, the United States of America. As in the Roman Empire, we are the Usan Empire. Anyway, this is nice to have the American in here. American killer, same as the old killer. American Killer comes into where I work, and yes, he does look like the wolf before dawn. He, was a he has a military walk with his own style of swagger, someone arrogant enough to think that he is the cosmos gift to humanity, the savior incarnate. For me, he looks ill with a tinge of gray in his white skin. He approaches me. He thinks he has found a new friend, and I am skeptical. Do you want to see a picture, he asks with glee and and a crooked smile. I'm not sure I want, I know what to expect, but I'm sure it, it, I will do it with regret. Reaching into his back pocket, he whips around his wallet with a picture holder, and he flips open right to the picture. What I see, what I see, what I see creates such revulsion in me. There is no high tree high enough to climb or a deep cave to hide, only this picture staring at me. There are only explosions going off all over my body. Anger rises a roller as a roller coaster reaches its peak, peak before crashing down with its speed and force. Indignation beyond my control. What is shown to me is this American killer standing with a helmet tilted, gun across his right shoulder, left foot on the backside of a dead Vietnamese man and left hand going to the back of the skull with the fingers coming out of the eye sockets where the eyes once had been. All hail our savior. All hail the American killer. All hail the defender of the empire and all he and does. I'm maddened. I'm at the edge of throwing lightning bolts. I want to believe I can breathe fire so that he and this ugly image becomes toast to ashes but I cannot breathe fire or throw lightning bolts. This is the face of those soldiers killing unarmed men, women, and children and wounded me. This is the face of soldiers at me lie. Look in the mirror and you may see that same face. It's the face that didn't question, that wrought what stands before me and those of the future, and there will be faces in the future, you can surely be sure as I write these words. The Empire will have many more ugly pictures of the American killers that are the same as the old killers. I, uh, I should tell you that um, uh, I want to write a piece on American Sniper, but I thought that's why I would read this tonight. But I will have a piece for you. Uh, it's going to be, uh, I hope. <laughs> All right, um, a little more uh, pleasant. <laughs> Floyd Red Crow Westerman, I don't know if anybody remembers Floyd. Uh, thank you, brother, thank you. Floyd was uh, the Minister of Culture for AIM, a wonderful actor, wonderful singer. If you've never heard anything about him, please go on the internet, check him out. Floyd Red Crow Westerman. 
Floyd gave a speech once about uh, the tree uh, a couple years before he died. And I wish I would have gotten this done to him before he died, but here's the Floyd. For Floyd Redco Westerman, there once were cultures that prayed through trees while others decorated them in tanks. Still others lived from the fruit given and they ate and played while other cultures celebrated the trees for their ability to dance and bend with the wind, they emulated that dance below. Other cultures knew trees were the lungs of the earth, all, all breathed easier, caring for them. Some cultures loved trees for their qualities and uh, the weepers, grand, stately, spindly, those that shimmer, quiver. Still other cultures knew that the trees held the land, kept it from sliding and walked easy on the earth. The wisest of these cultures knew the trees for all the qualities of love. Though there are cultures who still do these things, new cultures have arisen. They see trees only as a way of profiting from the flesh for fiber, houses, furniture, all for their own personal gain and greed. Those trees will no longer dance with wind, no longer the weepers and grand, stately, spindly, those that shimmer and quiver, no longer able to keep up with the, uh, being the healthy ones of the earth, and to provide the fruit that was given, no longer able to hold the flesh of the earth together. The forests are dying. It's not that we can't use the trees for benefit, but that we do so so unwisely. We fail to listen and learn uh, from the Aboriginal people who have already made these mistakes and learned and gained the wisdom, who knew wisely the best way to use the land where they live. We in the modern world have not, and look what we have brought upon us, the flora and the fauna. May the earth and the life that has been murdered forgive. Back up, she did was the was the uh, keynote this, this this evening, but the keynote always can go to the open mic and based on the buck. So she's coming up now. Give her a nice round. Of applause. Thank you. I have one poem uh, I just wrote. Mental detritus. I don't own my own thoughts. They're someone else's. Someone else always gets the credit. And I wish I could get rid of memories. The same ones occur and recur, like hearing the Kreutzer Sonata in a cold Milwaukee apartment, just replaying like an old 33 and a third. Dreams though are separate, beyond the pale. Luckily, I can forget them. I long for a state free from memory. I live in a dream within a dream. My thoughts bleed off a cliff. Okay. All right, that brings you, me to you, or you to me. Or pulling it out, you want to take it out. Microphone carefully. Don't do this at home. We are trained. We are trained. We are poets. We are trained. <laughs> so um, I'm going to read two for you this evening. Um, it only take about a half hour, 45 minutes, and I'll just race right through it all. Um, this was written by um, Avacha, and it's dedicated to Pat Parker, who uh, was born in Texas in 1944, died in California in 1989, and my nephew's wife is her daughter, and somehow Avacha and I are now cousins. That's, that's the best we've been able to figure that out. But this is called, well, there's a poet. A poet will never be allowed the luxury of blindness. A poet is a receiver, an antenna, a transmitter, all wrapped in one. A poet sees it all and hears it all and is ob obligated to tell everything. A poet is at best a storyteller, a juro, a historian, a keeper of the flame. We're walking pin cushions who can even feel tomorrow breathing down our backs. We can taste yesterday's laughter and see the tears you've yet to cry. We're sound junkies who don't know how to be quiet. A poet just can't stop it. We can't turn it off like it's an 
avalanche of words, the beauty, the terror, the power of sound, it's all around us, it's everywhere and everything, all the time. We don't have to go looking for a poem. Poetry follows us like a shadow. It just keeps on coming and it won't go away. We're driven people. Call it a gift, a healthy <coughs> obsession. Call it a poem. Poet is everything and nothing, a lover and a liar, a gossiper and a gift bringer and the light at the end of the tunnel. A poet is as new as the morning and older than dirt. And a good poet, just like good poetry, is forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. That's it. I probably should have read this first, so that would be the cleansing of the palate. So, um, let me see if I have the pages in the right order here. Oh, there's only two. Good, that's fast. So, this, uh, if you heard, if you, on the 17th of this month at Viracocha, which is 21st in Valencia, it's a, a nice, they, they do with a, a word party there. And uh, one of the hosts, Jennifer, always does a mashup of the poems that are presented. And this is a mashup of the old one of those mashups. And then I put it in a blender, and then I word process it, and then I cut it and draw it. I did all kinds of stuff. And the result was this. Advice from a deranged muni addict. And this is an epistle. And I spelled that wrong, but it's okay. <coughs> Done damage enough to your juxtaposable self? Do you really want to back up your fight frights? Or just leave them on the inside of that barrier your id wants to chew out through? Why, it's almost as if you want to return to the jaws of death, which for all their fury are just another iconic challenge, not unlike the keyboard of life at infamous Golden Calf or whoever a walrus really was, or the egg man for that matter. <laughs> and as for those dreaded musicians, who, no matter their quality, can be identified by their low moans, extinct ideals, or their avid love to hate of any snickering bibliophilic demeanors, and howl with laughter when blurring the distinction between mystery and matter. Which Reminds me, I'm no expert in the field, but it seems to me your self-image has morphed into harpies addicted to inflatable bimbo dolls. Or, or are you just plain tired? I tell you, just press Alt, Control, Delete, Shift, recite the heroic acronyms of doctor disease while your mind erases your files, drink dark draughts of chaos, then, then perform the correct sequence of right-handed gesticular obeisances as you multitask performing Tai Chi and Qigong, after which you pee into the red chalice of crystal morbidity and finish off by reciting the graphics up by the phosphorus cleanser on Chernobyl. Then you get to take out your order of razor nettles, rose thorns, and cactus spines dipped in relevant pus. I mean that. Then set yourself up with some hard drugs and dose up already. I mean, get serious. Quit looking so severe, tired of acting dumb as a thumb. Take this warning. Don't eat your fingers and bleed to death. Think of what lurks beneath each and every fingernail. The very thought of that frightens me so much my teeth clatter so much they shatter. And no, worshiping a plastic Jesus glowing with dark radiation just won't cut it. You cannot return to what has previously been exploded unless you're God and can take your chances between history and fable. Go trumpet your mad attires, risque oblige, and sit on your instrument at your own risk. It's not as if I will no longer see you, nor care how rabid dysfunctional hydras curdle up over your foaming, smeary lips every time your raspy breath exudes a fetid, mere nauseous gas. <sighs> Multiply these factors by all the gallons of clean West Virginia water you can find, then find someone to trust, or failing that, anoint yourself. Go down the rabbit hole, feasting on hors d'oeuvres and fairy delights, and ignore the scabs of corporate America crawling over your reddening skin, already splitting open because of its thick, coalescing ooze from irrational rashes. Scratch and the blistering spreads. Before crusting over and breaking open to a festering rings with writhing with maggots, you scream as this virulent plague overtakes your boil-infested flesh, and screaming hyperbolic sirens sing you into the sky, calling you, calling you, and you rise to them, even as some horrific vision shreds your fervid dreams and ruination racks every nerve in your ravaged body, falling, falling, falling through clouds of blood where endless denizens of death fight ferociously, tearing and rending all comers as they fall in the air, murderous in their multitudes. And you, you think you got problems? Think again. <laughs> Thank you so very much. All right. This brings us to 
Lewis, Martin, and then our feature of the evening, the wondrous Sarah Page. Are you with me? Are you Thank you. Give them a round, please. I was taking donations. I am not as tall as Dan. And so that I don't have to follow, really, Monsieur Lady, yes. I am going to follow Stefan Malarmé, which is probably even more intimidating. Well, my daughter said she is my best advisor. She said it was okay to do this. I have a translation of La Pipe Chatelier by Stephen Malamé. So I'm going to read it by paragraph in translation so that you can hate me for this. <laughs> La Pipe Chatelier, you l'avec ma simple ivresse de renaître autre que l'histrion qui vous gaste okay Complume la suie et noble conquête, j'ai trouvé dans le mur de trois lunes de lettres. Eyes laced with my simple intoxication to be reborn, other than the actor who with gesture evoked, like a plume, the low soot of the lamps, I have pierced through the canvas wall of the window. De mes jambes et des bois, l'épine n'a joué traître, à bon multiplier, régnant le mauvais hamlet, c'est comme si dans l'onde j'éprouvais, mille sépulcres de rivières disparaître. Clear swimmer traitor with my arms and legs and multiplied bounds, denying the bad hamlet. A thousand sepulchres to disappear there in virgin purity. Il l'air hors de cymbal et de poids, il le paie. Tout à coup, le soleil frappe la nuit de paix. Qui pour cette salle de ma fraîcheur de nacre. Penarius golden symbol irritated by fists. Suddenly the sun strikes the nakedness which exhales pure from my freshness of nacre. Rods need in a full quant sur moi, vous passiez, ne chantant pas en gras, qui était tout son massacre, c'est far noyé dans l'uperdu des glaciers. Rancid night of the skin when you passed over me, not knowing ungrateful it was my consecration, the makeup drowned in the treacherous waters of the glaciers. <laughs> you're mashing more things together, Dan? Wow. Is that what you're doing? You're going to read this over on the 17th? It, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, Jennifer's in Amsterdam? Yeah. Okay, this is my own poem. It's called Resonance Resonating. I want to push my words to the boundaries of all known worlds and then beyond. I want the lasting word, the enduring and endearing one, to go casting about in space and time, becoming universal travelers and vagabonds, abandoning rhyme and all the other old familiar tricks. Vagabond dainfa. Let them go as exiles in search of new meaning and utterance in uncharted territories of mind space. I want to be poet, musician, mathematician, teetering on the edge of self-destruction or resurrection. Um, do, um, do, toi. And I want the newfound words to stir the heart to a frenzy to be the reverberation of a whole new generation of word geometry. Some do to run on me with curls and rhyme in the most unlikely positions with posture in the pasture and moisture left on Mars. Oh, teach us how to be legal here but not there. Teach us the way of the masters, masters. Toi do, toi do, zoom. Let them uncover these words on the run. Toi do, toi do, zoom. 
residents of resident reality with gleaming generality, miracle glimmer, and the silky shimmer of blue Delius Frederick with girls grabbing at his giant ism, thrusting and throbbing in a most unholy rendition of heaven's, heaven's way. Has he found the sweet duality, reality of the demonic? E-R, E-R, son. And while plunging to the bottom of her sea scene, has he heard the tale?